When a character makes reference to something outside the story, we call it breaking the fourth wall. Today, we'll talk about what it means to break the fourth wall. Then we'll see how Job in the Bible makes a reference to you, the reader. Then we're going to see how Alice in Wonderland makes a reference to you, the reader. And we're doing some technical Hebrew work today, folks, so buckle in. The fourth wall is a theater term. Every room on stage can only have three walls. The audience sees through the imaginary fourth wall. Referring to the audience became known as breaking this fourth wall. But it's a fun literary technique across media, and it makes great humor. Sometimes a character addresses the audience directly. Sometimes a character says something that only the audience can understand, but the character might not even get the reference. This kind of meta joke was a favorite of filmmaker Mel Brooks, someone who made films with a lot of parody. Blazing Saddles ends in a glorious riot that extends across the movie lot and crashes into other sets while other movies are filming. One character even says, I'm working for Mel Brooks. In Spaceballs, the bad guys watch the movie Spaceballs to peek at the next scene and find out where the good guys are. Alice and Job also use a lot of parody. Last time I talked about some of my favorites. Job uses parody to make fun of his friends who insist that he must have done something really bad. They can't imagine God punishing him otherwise. And Job gets really frustrated with these friends. He feels like they're not listening when he says he's innocent. If Nicolas Cage were portraying Job, he might say something like this. No, Eliphaz, no. I do not think it is a good idea. In fact, to me, it sounds a little bit crazy in the head, okay? Finally, Job says, man, I wish somebody would just write down my words and put them in a book. Let's look at this more closely. Now, it's true that we can't just read into this with a modern concept of book. The Hebrew word sefer is used for all kinds of written things, but that's not important for this joke to work. Job hopes that one day someone in the future will read his words. Now, remember that Job is an ancient legend. Someone in the Persian period took this ancient legend and made a hip-hop musical out of it. This adds another layer to Job's wording. Now, the Hebrew word, Lamed Ein Dalet, could be pronounced two different ways with two different meanings. Think about this English phrase. If I say I moped around, that means I'm sad. If I say I moped around, that means I ride a funny little bike all over town. Now, the first time you read Job's words, you'll probably read it as La'ad, forever. And that's already pretty funny. Job says, man, I want future generations to read my words. At which point you look up from reading and you say, hey, <laughs> that's me. Now, lots of commentators throughout history have said that these words make them feel like part of the story. But you might go back and reread it, this time with the pronunciation la ed, which means as a witness. This is how it appears in the ancient Greek Theodosian translation. Job saying, Someone's got to write the book of Job so everyone in the future can see how badly I'm being treated. Then on a second reading, Job says, Someone needs to write down my words as an official legal witness. Nothing to do with a literary work. Then there's his over-the-top exaggeration of all the chiseling tools. Medieval commentator Barakaya points this out. It's not enough that his words are written. They need to be engraved in a book with an iron stylus and then filled with lead and then scratched into a rock that will last forever. Now, a Persian inscription still stands like this in Iran. It's called the Bisitun inscription, and it's pretty special. On this inscription, Persian king Darius the Great talks about his victories in a bunch of languages with lead, iron, and stone. A lot of scholars suggest that Job may be doing another fourth wall break by referencing this inscription. It would be like Hamilton in the musical describing a statue of a woman with a torch in a book, even though the musical takes place a hundred years before the Statue of Liberty was built. This kind of inscription is obviously a big project, something that will last forever. Definitely out of Job's budget now that his cows are dead. On top of all of this, scholar Ed Greenstein adds that there's a pun between the Hebrew root sapar which means book or written message, and the Akkadian root, Saparu, which means bronze. So maybe Job said, and you know what? Write it in bronze, too. Let's sum up, because there's a lot going on here. Job is talking about people in the future reading his words with wordplay between forever and witness, Job's exaggerated description of his words being immortalized, a pun with Sapar, which means book or bronze, a reference to an inscription in Job's Reader's Day, all in just four lines of poetry. Breaking the fourth wall like this feels extra special to us today because it gives Job the last laugh. Not only did Job get his audience with God, he also got his words written down in a book so all of us future generations do know that he's innocent. 
Now let's go back to the way Alice breaks the fourth wall. As you read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, you're always off balance. You never quite find firm footing. The book throws at you. Zany characters, linguistic puzzles. You have to reread and think through wordplay and double meaning on every single page. Hopefully you're starting to see why I compare it to Job all the time. By the time you come to the third act, you don't know what to expect. And the Duchess is suspiciously kind. The first time Alice met her, she was loud and overbearing and obnoxious and intimidating. But now the super kind Duchess is off-putting. You clearly can't trust her. And now she has a moral lesson for every piece of nonsense in Wonderland. And the moral of that is, be what you would seem to be. Or if you'd like it put more simply, Never imagine yourself not to be otherwise than what it might appear to others, that what you were or might have been was not otherwise than what you had been would have appeared to them to be otherwise. She simplifies her moral lesson for the befuddled reader, only to have Alice say it would be even simpler if she could read it in a book. The joke here is on you, dear reader. Please. Take all the time you need to pause the video and make sense of the Duchess's moral lesson and then please explain it to the rest of us in the comments. Now the reader feels even more lost. You can reread it as many times as you want. You're not going to figure that out. Breaking the fourth wall is a way for authors to get your attention and demonstrate some self-awareness. It can also ease the tension when the book gets a little too serious. Job's debates with his friends and Alice's debates with Wonderland characters, they can be exhausting for a reader. They're full of wordplay, double meaning. By breaking the fourth wall, Alice and Job are telling you, it's okay, but try and keep up. By breaking the fourth wall, Alice and Job make you part of their story. And they hope it puts a smile on your face when you're feeling overwhelmed. So tell me in the comments, what's your favorite fourth wall break of all time? Or maybe what's your fourth favorite fourth wall break of all time? Thank you so much for watching Bible and Culture. I'm Dr. Armstrong. Please like and subscribe.